Uh, first off, um, I'm super, one, I'm excited and um, appreciative. Uh, just um, for me, uh, I think a lot of times, I always hated the subject of history. Like I hated it, uh, like the way it was taught in school. Um, yeah. I felt like they included a lot of like facts, right? But a lot of the facts I felt like were meaningless. For instance, I, I don't think it really matters if I know exactly what year George Washington was born, right? Like that, that piece of information doesn't very do much to talk about like the overall conversation that would probably be relevant that I would ever want to be discussing or at what year he got married or like there's a bunch of like little details like that, which I guess overall they're, they're, maybe they might matter to some people if they're trying to do a deep dive but for like explaining to me like the like i guess what really matters in history those kind of details typically are always irrelevant yep and i feel like um so i've I always i never was a big fan of history but like as i started getting older and um just the more you start becoming aware of what's happening around you you become more a little bit more like um you have to become interested. For instance, I think the first time where it was ever important to me was uh, uh, my junior year in high school. It's when, um, you, I don't know, uh, maybe it was, no, it was my senior year. Sorry, my senior year in high school. We had just read, like, um, I had taken um, U.S. history my junior year in high school. So in my senior year um, is when uh, there was actually, um, you know, uh, the the... 9-11 uh, happened and people started talking about, uh, you know, so, so there, were, there was a war on terror starting and we were yep. going to be invading and um, and at that point, uh, hearing about like things like total war and things like that, th it had a little bit more relevance because now I finally understood what total war meant, right? Um, and it was like, so then when we're talking about like the possibility of total war and going into, you know, uh, Afghanistan and, and Iraq, um, it was just like, the conversations I started having, they all seemed like the U.S. history class that I had taken the previous year, there were so many things that actually applied at that time. So it was like, wow, this stuff actually does have some relevance. That was like an, an eye-opener for me. But even still, there's just so much that's lost as far as... Um, like, I can get the facts, right? Okay, what year did we invade? Uh, what year did the 9-11 happen? Um, you know, who was the president at the time? Who issued the order? Like, I, I can get all of those details. How many men were lost? All of that stuff, that's there. But what I will never find in a textbook, what, or at least I, I imagine the people won't find in the textbooks, um, are just some of the sentiment that existed, like, during that time where, like, 7-Elevens and other places where people were just being complete bigots to people that were in those stores at that time. That's not going to be included in the history book. But it's something I remember, like, just some of that tenseness um, in those kind of situations. And I think being there for it, it gives you an insight that just it will never be told unless told by person to person. If that makes sense. I, I, I'm so glad that you brought up 9-11 because I think that that's the perfect thing that you begin to realize that something that you lived through, something that's alive in your memories is part of our history. Mm -hmm. um, to, to your earlier point, though, and this was our discussion uh, on Facebook uh, this morning, it, it's not just what you put in, it's what you leave out. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I, also, I also don't really care what year George Washington was born. And I, I really don't care when he got married, um, but uh, the fact that he owned slaves for his entire life yeah. and, uh, and, and didn't free them until until uh, after his death, yeah, that's kind of relevant to me and it sure. speaks to the character of America. Facts. Uh, I totally yeah. agree with that. That's. Yeah. I think that's actually a really. I, I love that line. It's not. It's not just what you put in. It's what you leave out. Um, because, yeah, that's a lot of the framing and things happen in that way. For example, I grew up believing Christopher Columbus was one of the greatest heroes. It, it goes... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, Christopher Columbus. And, and there's context to that story also. But mm -hmm. um, it, let me just also say that it goes it goes on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to get I don't want to get too biblical. Um, I, I also do teach classes on, on scripture. But, I, but I, I, I'm going to guess you've seen the movie The Black Klansman. I have not actually. I oh, should, I'll man. Add it to my list. I know, I know. It's something right. I need to. <laughs> no worries. But let me give you a context. At the very beginning of it, um, there's a, a person, Kwame Ture, um, whose whose name uh, previously was Stokely Carmichael, uh, begins by quoting um, some some words of wisdom. If if I am not for myself, who will be for me? 
if right. I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? And, and, and that was also quoted by Malcolm. It was, it was part of the things that people in the movement were saying. Um, mm. One of the things that always gets me is that they never explain who originated those words. It came from Rabbi Hillel, mm. who, is, who is roughly contemporaneous with, with Jesus. Um, the one thing that I like from, from Hillel, uh, in, in addition to that quote, that, that I would say that should be part of, of every person's um, knowledge base, is uh, he was asked once to teach the Bible while standing on one leg. So he was an old man, you know, how could he possibly teach the whole Bible standing on one leg? Well, he leaned on a chair, lifted up one of his legs and said, do nothing to your neighbor that you would not want your neighbor to do to you. That is the whole of the law. Absolutely. The rest of it is commentary. Yep. And, uh, and you know, that, that same sentiment is echoed in the Golden Rule. It's echoed in the New Testament, mm -hmm. in the Koran, um, in basically every, every religious book. And it's important that we teach that and teach that in the context of no matter what your other beliefs are, mm -hmm. we all believe in that. Right. That's part of everybody's, you know. And if, if we did that, maybe we'd have a couple less wars. Sure. Sure. And society would function better. I think that's, that is like, um, yeah, that, I think that should be the, you know, the driving force behind like, every, like almost all, like all charitable giving should, that should be the, the primary motivation for it. Um, you know, we'll be like trying to make sure that we, uh, improve a uh, functioning society. That should be the, be, uh, you know, the major motiv motivation there as well. I think that, that, that literally is what society is founded upon. I was, uh, one of my buddies was having a conversation, uh, I was reading one of his conversations yesterday with someone didn't believe that and that was kind of uh, that was a little interesting to me the person didn't believe that the person didn't believe that society that the the, the, the main primary function of society was trying to assure everyone's mutual benefits and that was that was interesting I don't know how you get there I, I don't even know where you continue from that point but well yeah. it, 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 it as a, as somebody that raised uh, two um, two two great grown children i'll tell you um that that person's parents didn't teach him about the necessity of sharing when they were a kid <laughs> there that, it is uh, that's where that comes from <laughs> you know sure. you know the, the the other part about that is you start talking about some of those things that seem like moral discussions and, and if you take it down to the level of a three-year-old mm -hmm. and you ask a three-year-old well let me ask you would you have more fun playing with your toys yourself or playing with a friend with the same set of toys, which way would you go? Mm -hmm. Oh, so mm -hmm. that that makes sense about sharing. Sure, sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you want? Should we should we jump into the the meat of the discussion itself? Do Absolutely. You want to talk a little bit about that? Okay. okay. So, uh, what I would just say was just going into it and from the very beginning is that. Um, again, as someone who wasn't like a very big history buff, um, there were a lot of things that like eluded me. And what what's forced me to like start learning about a lot of these things um, were debates. Um, I'd have conversations with someone um, when the riots and the protest, when the violent protests started happening. Um, you know, there were there was a lot of discussion on it, and so I was having a conversation with someone, and someone pointed out to me that a lot of times what accompanies violent protest is like radical change. And so, you know, I'm having this conversation and someone kept bringing up, like, so I'm asking them, so what are some riots that, what, what would you say were examples of, like, widespread violent protests that didn't have a lot of, um, that, that where there was no change? And they mentioned, um, they mentioned these Detroit riots, uh, I want to say in 1980. You, you go back even before that, you go back to the, the 60s. Um, I mean, but, no, the 68 riots, yeah, I believe they were 68. Yeah. And he, yep. was, he was talking about those riots, and he was like, yeah, those didn't have any crazy change associated with them. And so I started looking it up, well, and as I did, it was like, wait, no, this that can't be further from the truth. This this was humongous. And then that caused me to learn about, uh, you mentioned Bloody Sunday, there was something, uh, the hot, the long yeah. hot summer. Right, I had yep. never heard of that. It's not because it wasn't taught, probably, but I really didn't pay attention very much in history. So then that forced me to learn about that, which forced me to learn about Bloody Sunday, not under the name Bloody Sunday, but it forced me to learn about that because then that was another one. They were like, "Well, that's a riot that didn't do anything." And it was like, uh, "No, that was incredibly impactful." Like that, like, like almost immediately following that was when the Civil Rights Act was actually passed, right? And so there's just so much information that's 
because people when you're having these conversations it causes causes you to learn the difference between those conversations and this one is i'm not intending at all to debate i would rather just ask a bunch of questions or you explain to me things and then i'll probably be curious and ask questions like around the information um but i i just i i feel like um again there's so much that i don't know and then hearing it and i think hearing it from this perspective will make it stick more because i think it's it, it it humanizes the information in a way that I think makes it um, more palatable and makes it um, more relevant, such that I'd be able to like you know um, commit it to memory easier. So, so first of all, I, I do a lot of uh, a lot of public speaking um, in the games industry, uh, in in through IGDA, through a number of social groups. Uh, I got to tell you, man, that was the best introduction that I've ever had. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Great. Um, Great. I, I, I truly appreciate that. I, I will um, I will tell you, and this is something um, that 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 that's really Im important to understand. Um, I, I wrote this up to you, but um, the, the truth will not set you free. It, it may open your eyes. Mm -hmm. um, it takes it takes struggle to, to really set people free. Um, but you have to have a direction. You have to have some vision of, of where we're going. And, and I, I think in order to understand where we're going and how. Uh oh. Oh, no. Yeah, this, this place today. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. I'm um, sorry. I think that that's a, that's a, a core, core thing. Yep. One second. You said uh, in, in order to understand where we're going and then you cut out for a little bit. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, in order to understand where we're going, you have to understand where we came from, sure, and how we got to this place today. Because because history is is a long process. So, um, why don't we uh, why don't we we jump right into that? Um, okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you um, also that history is a living thing, and that um, what you are seeing today, it's important for you to keep it alive in your memories and and to pass it on. Um, I am going to almost guarantee you that if you if you took a time machine to the year 2060, and uh, and you looked at the way they they recount 2020, um, you may or may not see the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor mentioned in there. Right, right. All right. Um, you know, if you present the unrest in the streets without talking about that, it, it gives a it gives a very different perspective on it. So absolutely. Um, it's, it, it's important that, that, that anyone listening today, you know, keep those memories alive for the next generations. So um, let me also say, and this is stuff that also I, I had committed, to, uh, you know, to writing. Um, I suffer from observer bias, mm -hmm. as does as does everyone. Right. Um, you know, what you see depends on where you're we're standing to look at it. So a lot of these events uh, took place while I was living in New York. Um, uh, specifically in the Bronx, mm -hmm. um, uh, New Yorkers are by and large convinced that they live in the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I don't know anyone that's been to New York or knows New Yorkers that that, that doesn't resonate with. Um, the other thing that that I want to talk a little bit about or, or I want to disclose is that that I am Jewish. Um, I have taught Jewish history for for many years. Um, that is part of my. Um, both, both literal and metaphorical DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always like to start off when I teach classes um, by saying that if, if you're going to claim membership in any group, if you identify as being part of any group, you got to take the good with the bad. Right. So if you're if you're Jewish, um, you know you you're really proud that you you can number um, Albert Einstein, Jonas Salk, you know, and and that's great. Um, but if you're going to claim those guys, you also end up getting stuck with Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. Right. If you're uh, if you're if you're an African American today, um, it's great that, that you can point to, to civil rights leaders, to people that really changed the world in a peaceful manner, like Martin Luther King, um, John Lewis, the, the late great John Lewis. But you also end up um, with with Louis Farrakhan, uh, with some people who are um, less that you are less proud of being associated with. Sure. That's okay. Mm -hmm. We're all human and, and none of us is perfect. Right. Um, neither as individuals nor as groups. But it's it's just important to understand that there are, are kind of both sides of, of, of that issue. So right. um, that's something that I, I, I always like to disclose. And, and I'll also let you know one of the reasons um, that I do that is uh, 
I've, I've published a lot of stuff on the internet across the years. One day, um, a friend of mine notified me that my name appeared on a, on a kind of radical Islamic site, and they said that I was claiming to be famous by proxy, which I, I probably was guilty of, but I, but I do try to show kind of both sides of it. Hmm. Okay. Um, that said, we're all Americans. Let me rephrase it. You and I, at least, are, are Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, America is, is at its best in some sometimes when we do things that are a little bit surprising and i'll, I'll talk about about some of those events as as we go through um you know the history of, of my memories so when i was a little kid um i was only like six years old five six years old i mean kindergarten first grade um when when john f kennedy was elected okay. right jfk is elected um, he won a, a close and contested election due in part to a deal that was made with Mayor Daley of Chicago. Um, Mayor Daley was an old political machine guy, um, as reprehensible uh, an individual as you will find. Um, but man, he could deliver the vote. And, and one of the things that happened in the 1960 election is that um, parts of Chicago cast more votes for the Democratic candidate than um, people that actually lived in those areas. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, in, in Chicago, the uh, old joke used to be uh, vote early, vote often. Mm -hmm. um, it was not unheard of for people to go through cemeteries looking for the recently deceased so they could vote in their name. Right. Um, and that's going to come in later. It's not, this isn't a story about the 1960 election, but but when you make a deal with the devil, um, you better use a, you know, when you sup with the devil, you better use a long spoon. Right. So, so okay, so, so that was 1961. I'm going to fast forward to June 11th, 1963. Um, this was covered on, on television. We all... This two black wait, wait. students. Sorry, 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 uh, sorry. Vivian Malone and James. Oh, wait, one second, one second. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. It, uh, it's, you said this was covered on television. And you cut out again. I'm sorry about that. Go oh, ahead. sorry about that. In 19 and 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 part of this is uh, Discord has been going through some issues today. I've I've reported some of them, but but I'll, I'll repeat whenever you need me to. to you Perfect. can even just text me to to repeat it okay. um, if I drop. Um, so the Alabama governor in 1963 was a man named George Wallace. He blocked the entry of two black students. Vivian Malone and James Hood to the University of Alabama. Um, Wallace's saying was segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Mm -hmm. That was something that, that I remember as a kid. I remember being being scared of this, this man that, that looked so angry um, at, at the effrontery of, of two black students that were gonna go to uh, the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, in, in response, um, our president, JFK, issued an executive order um, that uh, placed the Alabama National Guard under federal control. And so they were able to force uh, the admittance of these students to Alabama. Um, it's a funny thing that happened um, as the years went by. What really broke segregation in the South was football. Okay, wait, before we go there, I'm, I'm keep that thought. So yep. when, 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 okay, so when JFK signed that executive order and um, basically like controlling them at that point so that they, uh, they could force those students there, was, okay, in your personal circle, circle did you find people that were divided on JFK's, um, on, on that decision? Absolutely, and it goes back before then, um, JFK, uh, JFK was the first non-Protestant president and the only mm -hmm. one, and by the way, didn't make it through his full term. Right. Um, JFK had suffered from criticism of dual loyalty that he was not really an American, but he was loyal to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So there were layers of, of disagreement about that. But yes, uh, did I find people that objected to the idea of integration? Yes. However, um, it was less of an issue because of where I came from in New York. New York was integrated at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and we looked at it as a division between the North and the South. Um, we looked at it as the educated liberal North having uh, better social policies than the uneducated South, and particularly Alabama. 
And the problem with that is that that divides America up, and you know, students of the Civil War will know how well that worked. Right. Um, did I find people? Did, did I know people that didn't want to go to school with black kids? I'm going to have to open up a message with you. about it? No. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I think that, but that, that was more because of where wait, I lived. Wait, one second, one second. Um, you got to re-repeat. You said, did, did I know people that didn't want to go to school with uh, black with, kids? With black kids? Yes, I did. Did I know people that were willing to commit violence not to do it? No, I didn't. But that was more mm. quality of coming from New York than than the racial tone of, of all of America. Okay, so then that, that highlights something that I think is kind of important there. Um... It's because okay, so I guess a lot of times, like when you when we're young, we're kind of taught that racism is something that's more, um, it's something extremely overt, right? Where you have like the Klansmen that's like literally burning a you know a, a burning cross on someone's lawn, telling them they don't want them living in that neighborhood, yep. and that's kind of like the face of what racism is, right? But then yeah. there's also a, a much more subversive, covert form of racism where people won't there it, it's not necessarily expressed it's not it's not necessary well not expressed openly uh, maybe maybe within within private circles it'll be talked about where people have similar sentiments but are just not willing to go to the same lengths in order to enforce their sentiments or in order to to uh, bring attention to it if that makes sense it, it absolutely does. There's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning book and a movie that was made from that book uh, about anti-Semitism called The Gentleman's Agreement. Mm. And at the time it was done, um, Jim Crow laws were still in effect. In fact, Jim Crow laws were something that I remember being defeated during my lifetime. And I'll come back to that in a That's minute. Crazy. But let me just talk about A Gentleman's Agreement. The idea was that there were laws that zoning laws, red lines that prohibited where where people of color could live. Mm -hmm. Jews were blocked from um, from moving into certain places without having the laws, but there was an under the table gentleman's agreement made that you wouldn't sell your house to somebody whose name was Cooper. Mm. And uh, an interesting uh, a side story about that, um, the, the major movie studios, many of which had, had Jewish owners or Jewish management, would refuse to make a, a, a movie of this Pulitzer Prize winning book about anti-Semitism. They were afraid of the backlash on that. The guy that ended up making the movie, the, the director of it was Daryl Zanuck. <clears throat> Daryl Zanuck was Eastern European, but not Jewish. But he had been turned down for admission to the Hollywood Country Club because he was Jewish. And when he went in and said, but I'm not, they said, yeah, all you people say that. True story, so his revenge mm -hmm. was, was making this movie about anti-Semitism. Movie's got a great line in it. Um, one of the characters says, oh, I'm not prejudiced. Some of my best friends are Jewish. Mm -hmm. Woman at the table, woman at the table says, some of your best friends are Episcopalian, but you don't go around telling everybody about them. <laughs> So, uh, and, and again, you know, it's, it's funny. I can tell that joke with, with anyone who's ever encountered prejudice and they all get it. Yep. Um, so, okay, so, so there we were, 1963, June of 1963, and, uh, and JFK uses what you can, you can pretty up, but essentially is, is military force to get two students to be able to attend the University of Alabama. Then we go fast forward to November 22nd of 1963, and JFK is assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a Southern Democrat, and I'm, I'm emphasizing those words because mm -hmm. Southern Democrat almost, almost invariably meant racist. LBJ becomes the president of the United States. Um, his, his naming to the vice presidency was very controversial. Um, Bobby Kennedy said to his brother Jack, oh, but you hate Lyndon. Why are you naming him? And, this, and, and, L, and, and, and JFK famously said, yeah, I know I hate him, but he'll win me Texas. Hmm. So, uh, so JFK is assassinated on 11-22-63, and then on 11-24-63, as he is being escorted out of the Dallas police headquarters, um, Jack Ruby murders Lee Harvey Oswald on television. And uh, I'm going to tell you um, 
the shooting of JFK and the, the murder of, of Lee Harvey Oswald before he could ever come to trial um, is what launched so many of the conspiracy theories in America. Sure, sure. Uh, it just seemed so improbable. Okay, so, so that kind of winds up 1963, but at the end of that time, at the end of that year, remember this is late November. Wait, 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 um, wait, 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 I'm sorry. We got to stop for a second here. Uh, yeah, because right. so someone said it, and I, I also had no idea. That I, I didn't know that Lee Harvey Oswald was, was murdered on, on actual television. That sounds... Yeah crazy as freak um so like what was was it like was he being escorted at the time like how, how did that happen yep he, the police are taking him out of the building there are cameras all around to, to you know take take the pictures you know well, what, what we call the perp walk today right mm -hmm. so his hands are cuffed behind him he's got two dallas police officers jack ruby um is wearing the id of uh, of a newspaper reporter walks up to him and shoots him to death hmm what happened and to Jack or, Ruby? Well, Jack Ruby would end up dying in prison. Um, it uh, it was never clear what his motivation was. Um, we we talked to those guys, um, but uh, there are, there are a whole series of books on that. Um, but it's never been really clear why he killed Oswald. Was he involved in a plot with Oswald? Was this the Soviets? Was this New Orleans? Was this the KKK? Was I mean, you name all the possible <laughs> conspiracy theories. Sure. And and and, and nobody, to this day, nobody knows. And and when we talked about history, um, we talked about the things that happened, and that we don't know all the things that happened. And you're right, but you know what? When we talk about the motivations, oh man, it really gets murky. We right. really don't know why somebody did what they did. That's see, that's the hardest thing to explain in history, right? Like, it, just in general, uh, you can live with someone, be married to someone, and then not know exactly what their their driving motivations are. That's still something you learn, and those motivations change on a regular basis. And then at that point, then what you thought you knew about the person, com like completely, you know, it's it's just off now. Um, and so, I think all of that, yeah, it's just it's difficult. But it speaks to another point though, where. <laughs> Like, like you said, uh, that's what would lead to so many conspiracy theories. Like the same thing with um, uh, Epstein, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, right? Absolutely. It's the same exact concept. Hearing this brings me to today, something that in my lifetime where you have so many people where it's still an, an ongoing meme that he didn't kill himself, right? And 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 so at this point, it's just. I, yeah. I've, I've heard the phrase a billion times and I hated it because it was always what people would use as a justification for why we needed to know history. Um, and I hated it because I hated history. But it is true. Like, if, if you don't know history, it does repeat itself. And, and, and even again, knowing it won't prevent it from repeating itself. But at least it gives you a perspective in the situation to recognize that these things are prone to happen and to, you know, kind of tell a, a different narrative if, if you allow it to. Years, years ago, I asked a yoga teacher why they did things in a certain way. And uh, he, he paused and looked at me and said, because we've had 4,000 years to try all the other ways and this one works. <laughs> and that's what history, that's what history is. It's great to learn from, you know, from your own mistakes, but man, it's even better to learn from somebody else's. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so okay, so at the end of 1963, we're left with this, the country in, in, in kind of chaos. Our president has been assassinated, and the assassin has been assassinated. Um, we don't know who did it. Um, and, and we lost a northern liberal, a Bostonian, uh, great speaker in JFK, and instead LBJ, who we didn't elect, is now in the presidency. Um, okay, fast forward to June 21st 1964 three civil rights workers James Earl Cheney Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner are murdered in Philadelphia Mississippi um, by the Klan hmm. the the case becomes known as Mississippi burning um, we have had multiple court records on this there have been a number of different trials there's a, a movie about it um, these three young men are pulled over um, by the by the, the Philadelphia, Mississippi police and are held until the police notify their friends in the Klan that they're releasing these guys and what road they can find them on. And this, this happens, the three of them are, are murdered. And it's a, it's a fairly big issue that's going on at the time. 
um, you know, the, the murder of these civil rights workers. Now, one thing I also want to point out, and, and that goes to my earlier point about, about my own background, um, there are bonds between people that are, and I don't want to be overly dramatic, but this is absolutely literal, um, that are written in blood. Mm. Um, in this case, in this case, you know, the, when you see depictions today of, of the Freedom Riders, mm -hmm. um, you will rarely see any pictures of of white people going along with with uh, the black young men and women on the buses, but there were, mm -hmm. and uh, and in some cases we laid down our our lives on that for the for the cause of freedom. Sure. Uh, this wasn't their battle, but because because every man is linked, it was their battle. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to point that out. I don't want to be too melodramatic. But I'm going to come back to some points on that later on. Okay. So that took place on June 21st, 1964. Remember earlier we were talking about how it takes struggle, how it, how something always precipitates, um, precipitates change. Sure. Well, on uh, July 2nd, 1964, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, a Southern Democrat, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Not only did he sign the Civil Rights Act, but he turned around and handed the pen that he had used to a man that was standing behind him that he wanted to honor Martin Luther King. Wow. So, um, as, as I said, you know, sometimes America is, is at its best when we do things that are, that are kind of unexpected or that, that seem to, to be bucking the current on that. Um, so the first civil rights act is, is signed, um, on, uh, on, uh, uh, February uh, 26th of 1965, um, unarmed 26-year-old Jimmy Lee Jackson is beaten and then murdered by Alabama troopers. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Here's another, just some more ignorance coming from me. No, so no. I always thought, hmm, like up to now I've been talking about the Civil Rights Act being passed in 1968, right? Was, so when... Right. So when you mentioned just now the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I'm like, well, that can't be right because it was in 1968. So I go, I Google it and it's like, oh, no, this was just an expansion of the Civil Rights Act, which was the Fair Housing Act, which is just also referred to the civil, as the Civil Rights Act. Yep. So there, there were, yeah, this is something, again, I didn't know. Like, uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, there, yeah I, I'm, I'm excited to have learned that piece of information. I'm probably going to do a little bit of deep diving into that. And, and again, um, the thing that was that that stands out. I mean, it was it was long overdue to have that sign. But the thing that stands out to me is that um, it was done by somebody that we didn't expect it from. We didn't expect right. LBJ to do this. And and it's it's funny. Um, I shouldn't say funny. It's sad that LBJ's legacy is um, is is tarnished um, by the Vietnam War, which he did not start, which Kennedy in fact started. But, mm. but Kennedy gets a, a clean pass on that, and LBJ had it laid to, to his uh, doorstep. But, but let me move on, because I'm going to give you another thing that you didn't realize. The reason I was talking about unarmed 26-year-old Jimmy Lee Jackson being murdered in mm. Alabama is the consequence of, of his murder on the Alabama side is that the first of the marches across the um, Edmund Pettus Bridge takes place. Mm. Um, on, on March 7th, 1965, um, Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, um, American Ambassador Ralph Bunch, uh, the late great John Lewis march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and and we all know that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also important to note that with them um, are Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, and Greek Greek Orthodox um, Arch Archbishop um, Iacovos. Uh, the march and the subsequent police beatings. You know that famous photo that you've always seen of John Lewis being struck on the head by the Alabama trooper? Mm -hmm. That picture was taken by a guy named James Spider Martin. Yep. And James Spider Martin was uh, was a, a white Southern photographer. Um, he he took a lot of those a lot of those famous pictures. Um, he's a really interesting guy. He had um, two accents. He had a, a barely discernible. Um, uh, southern accent that was his normal everyday speaking voice and then he had an accent that he used when um, he was confronted by the Alabama or the Mississippi police or the Klan um, he uh, called his accent uh, southern deep fried 
<laughs> he had that deep fried accent. Right. Yeah. Um, so I want to point out something. Sure. All right. Uh, making that very personal for myself. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess Dave Chappelle and other you know, comedians have talked about it at, at a different time. But we, uh, there's a thing called code switching. Have you ever heard of that phrase before? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. So it's basically the, the concept that um, uh, tip, like black Americans very often have the ability to speak... Um, Two, oh, oh. two different ways, right? So, like Dave Chappelle, you'll hear uh, someone asked him on, on inside the actor studio. They they mentioned that the w whenever he's imitating white people in his skits, um, he goes into like pitch perfect standard, you know, standard English, and yeah. you know, it, and it's just he does it, and he could. So, if he chose to, he could speak that way at any time. Um, and Dave Chappelle kind of mentioned about just the fact that we all have the ability to speak in those two different ways so um for me typically um i would say ah, man it's it's really weird so growing up um i think i sp i spoke specifically very proper um properly and then as i got older i started learning uh street vernacular street vernacular and started started uh, changing the way i spoke and then as i got into gaming um then i like um, exaggerated even more but so it's but but in professional settings and and um and at home and you know whatever then I would speak the way I what was natural to me but now it's become blended so much that um and because I spend less time like in school or speaking to you know professional people mm -hmm. so that now it's blended so that I would almost feel like um the non proper speaking is more natural to me than what was the, than than the other way so, so on, the, on uh, it absolutely does. And and, and uh, on that note, um, one of my favorite stories is that uh, Chris Weber, basketball player, mm -hmm. uh, when he joined the University of Michigan, now Chris had gone to Detroit Country Day School, mm -hmm. which is every bit as posh as it sounds. When he came to Ann Arbor, he went up to Jalen Rose, who was from Detroit, and said, "Hey man, can you uh, can you help teach me how to speak black?" <laughs> Wow. Um, that said, everybody does. Well, let me rephrase it. Everybody that's from um, an ethnic group does that at one time or another. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, if I'm in a in a situation where somebody asks me um, when the next Jewish holiday is, and I realize that the room is full of non-Jews, I'm going to go, "Oh, you mean Hanukkah?" Right, right. <laughs> we we all kind of do that. I'm I'm just you know I'm representing at that point. Right? Sure, so, sure. Uh, um, but, but again, but again, but again, we we all do that. Right. Um, uh, so all right. So so the, where we left off was that you know, the, the march and the police beatings are recorded by by James Spider Martin, mm -hmm. and that takes place that takes place in March of, of 1965. In August of 1965, LBJ will sign the second bit of legislation, the Voting Rights Act, which, if I live to see one thing, I would love to see that renewed mm. uh, uh, and ex and expanded. Because if there's a single fundamental thing that that uh, America needs, it's that we all vote. Mm. And uh, whoever came up with the idea of putting voting on a weekday. In November. You're right. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. You know, if, you live, yeah. If, you live in, if you live in Cali or you live in, in Vegas or you live, you know, anywhere in the warm places, you don't understand what it's like voting <laughs> in Michigan in sure. November. Sure, sure. You have, you have no idea what the weather's going to be. It could yeah. be it could be snow. Cats could be falling out of the sky. I mean, you just don't know at all. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I would, I, you know, as rich as we are, I'd like to see us move the the voting to either either to a, a weekend or make it uh, an official holiday. Because what day is more important than that? Sure. But, but there you go. Right now, voting favors. Um, what's the term I'm looking for? Oh yeah, rich white people. Um, <laughs> Facts. So, so this was how we originally got got into a talk. I had uh, I had posted a, a picture of some. Um, black men carrying what you know what we call these days long rifles um mm -hmm. on their backs at a, at a recent protest and i told you that um this was not the first time that i had seen that right um, it is very popular among people that want to 
blow off the, the, the murders of, of Breonna Taylor or George Floyd by saying, well, look at black on black crime, which is kind of a way of saying, y'all are killing each other. I guess I get to kill you too. Right, right. Um, um, but there was a, a group that, that stood up and said, hey, we are going to fix this problem. The police are not policing our neighborhoods. They don't come through our neighborhoods. And when they do, they don't do any good. They do the other side. So we're going to take the rights into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And they formed the Black Panther Party. That was Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, Elbert Hubbard. Um, the Black Panther Party was um, formed in Oakland. Right. The very sight of young black men armed wearing leather jackets and berets, mm -hmm. um, but, but holding guns, causes the National Rifle Association for the only time in its history to support gun restrictions. <laughs> That's a irony. Yeah. I, uh, I, I couldn't make this up, um, but, but, but there we are. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more ab about, uh, about the Black Panther Party because, again, there was, there was, not, um, there was not a single consensus on, on, on any of the sides about what direction should we go in. Mm -hmm. um, were we going to embrace pacifism at all costs, or do we need to accomplish change by any means necessary? Mm -hmm. um, and that division, um, that division was a sincere one. So now we get to 1968. Um, back to your earlier point about the, the change that took place in 1968. One mm -hmm. of the events that really helped push through um, some legislation was that on April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King is murdered mm -hmm. in Memphis, Tennessee. And this begins a, a period of, of riots in, a, in American cities. Sure. Um, those, were, those were a series of you know, what we refer to as, as race riots, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Got to watch out what that definition is. Um, bombing the hell out of Tulsa, Oklahoma wasn't a race riot back right. in 1920 one it was something else right um, but That's but again so, so we had those we had those riots in uh, august 23rd of of 1968 uh, the democratic convention is taking place in chicago and four days of of riots begin there the the causes are complex um one of the major factors in there was the Vietnam War. And you were talking about how you didn't pay attention to, to history that much as a young man. Mm -hmm. Well, my generation, we did. We did pay attention to history because history was going on around us and it was, it was absolutely personal and it would come up and touch you. At the high point of the Vietnam War in 1968, 50,000 young men were drafted each month. I am not speaking out of turn. 50,000 men were drafted each month. 600,000 were drafted each year. And the casualty rate by 1968 had hit 1,000 a month. It, but yes. it's, funny, I, it's funny I say that in this time of coronavirus when 1,000 a day and we kind of blow that off. But, yeah. but this was the topic that was on everybody's lips and that was, that was a a major thing and it and it crossed barriers if you remember if you remember muhammad ali um famously refusing to go and and, yep. and you know accept his draft notice mm -hmm. uh, just another case of the white man sending the black man to go fight the yellow man to preserve land that he stole from the red man right um, that was muhammad ali's quote on the topic Let, so, really really quick if i can interject um so sure. muhammad ali was exceedingly well spoken exceedingly well spoken and really really mentally sharp and the way that he dictated everything um that that was one of the things so like you just know of him as a boxer right but it's it's a passing thing because again he was way before my time so it, it was just like i just knew of him as a boxer i always knew the name i saw pictures of him um you know but that that was it and one day i just randomly i'm gonna say maybe about 10 years ago no, closer to eight years. Eight years ago, I watched my very, very first Muhammad Ali interview, just being curious, like, well, what was, yep. you know, whatever. And it was insane. It was like this, the most, one of the most eye-opening things. Now, he happened to be, uh, you know, Nation of Islam, which, of course, is just maybe contrary to some of my personal religious beliefs. But um, 
it's just hearing the way he spoke and how articulate and the amount of dignity that he had um like, like a, a uh, he just, he just had a, a sense of power and a sense of personal um presence about himself that was um just remarkable and it was um incredible so then as i was watching more and more of his interviews and like reading more and more about him and then yeah i started hearing about um you know how he was uh he, he he refused to go to the war and then he i think they tried to strip him of his medal um oh he, he was stripped of his medal he was sent to prison he was stripped right. of his title yeah um, but one they, of the they, one of the they, go ahead quick they did everything to him but burn him at the cross right but one of the beautiful things was i i'll never forget it was him talking about him going fighting for the united states um in the olympics winning a gold medal and then coming back and not being able to sit at a restaurant because he was black like so he's able to re represent america in the olympics an actual champion and they're just like no no no, but you're black so you can't sit at this restaurant like th those kind of things were so eye-opening to me um because we we it's so easy to look at martin luther king i mean i'm mean, wow as as muhammad ali is so 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 much before my time he was still very much alive like you know um i, I remember him carrying the torch um, and I want to say the 96 Olympics games. And I remember him sitting at a table with Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton talking about just the dignity of who he was. Um, at that point, his, his Parkinson's was really, really bad. Um, and it's just, so that's just a figure that has always, since, since he just, he, he, he's come to mean so much more to me uh, as I got older than I did as just a kid. It's just, oh, this is this old athlete, right? Um, he yeah. was, he was not, not only very well spoken and very, very thoughtful. Um, but I will also say the other side, um, for those, those of, of my generation that got to watch him fight, you know, more or less live, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mike Tyson was the most dominant fighter during his run, but mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali was the most beautiful. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, I remember, I, I remember as a kid, um, rooting against him when he fought Sonny Liston, mm. um, which, which one? Because because he'd been so brash, he'd come out with a bear trap. I mean, he had talked all of this stuff, and then we watched him fight, and you just fell in love with it. Right. It was it, poetry in motion. It, it really was. Yeah. yeah it was so amazing. so where where I was up to was um, talking about the Chicago riots, and 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 I, I have a, a a thing that I, I want to talk about a little bit after that, but um, so. One of the things that we've learned was that the violent reaction to the protests by the Chicago police has been termed a police riot. Mm -hmm. um, the term the world is watching was used about that. And then older Americans um, saw the riots on the street. They saw people being beaten up. They saw photographers with their heads bloodied. I mean, as bad as the current riots are today, but, but even worse. And they went the other way. Um, they voted for Nixon as the law and order president. Um, same words that Donald Trump is using today. See, it's um, so funny. So really quick to interject one more thing, um, sure. more, more on point this time. Uh, so all of the things that you're talking about are identical to what we're seeing today, right? Um, like these are the first large scale um, protests and riots that I've been alive for. I mean, there were the Watts riots, which were, I want to say, in 94 or something. Um, yep. but, but, but I was, goes, it, I was 10. It goes, yeah, I got you, man. And, and it goes back before then. I mean, um, if you, if you want to take a look at, um, how we got unions, how we were able to get, you know, some of the labor laws that everybody in America has benefited from, you have to look back at the Haymarket riots in Chicago mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's turn of the century. Um, it, 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 let me, let me also tell you something else about, um, about American history. Um, when um, when we first implemented it or instituted the draft back in Civil War days, mm -hmm. um, three black men that had absolutely nothing to do with it were hanged from lampposts in New York. Um, that was the response to the to the draft for the Civil War. Hmm. So um, again, it's it's history. It's it's events that are documented, um, but we don't we don't teach it. Right. Um, so, okay, so we're, we're up to the, the law and order president. Well, one of the things that happened out of the Chicago um, riots, so eight men were arrested as leaders of the riots. And, and you know, if you're, if you're a casual student of it, you know about 
you, you know about people like Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, you know, who are leaders of the of the Youth International Party that, you know, that you saw those pictures. Um, one of the guys that you probably don't know about was Bobby Seal, whose name was mentioned earlier as one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. Um, he was also arrested and he did not want to be tried with the other seven. The other seven had a, a, a lawyer um, who had made his, his name, you know, defending uh, people that were, you know, considered on the radical left, uh, William Kunstler. He didn't want to be part of that, didn't want to be, be lumped in with everybody else. He wanted to be tried separately. Um, the judge in the case who had been handpicked by, uh, by Nixon and by J. Edgar Hoover, a guy named Julius Hoffman, um, did not want to allow Bobby to be tried separately. And Bobby began to disrupt the courtroom proceedings. Um, by doing what we in America hate most, a young black man asserting his civil rights. Mm. Sorry, was that too sarcastic? No, not at um, all. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he wanted to be tried separately, so um, he began to disrupt the courtroom proceedings. And Judge Hoffman did something that um, I, 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 I'm very careful about using the word unique because things do tend to repeat, but this was kind of unique. Um, for a number of days, Bobby Seale was brought into the courtroom, carried into the courtroom in a chair, bound and gagged, and had chains on him so that he could not rock the chair. Wow. America watched a black man looking like uh, uh, a pre-Civil War slave being carried into a courtroom in Chicago. Holy smokes. What was his name again? Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale. Wow. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll drop my uh, my notes into the channel um, as a PDF when this is done. You guys are, are all free to, to use them. Perfect. Um, Thank so you. So Bobby, Bobby Seale would not get convicted uh, of anything um, related to the Chicago riots, um, but he would be sentenced to 48 months in prison. Contempt of court? I knew it. I knew it. I'm not psychic. I'm just observant. <laughs> While, while in prison, he'd be charged and tried in a separate murder case a, accused of killing an informant. And that trial um, would end up in a hung jury um, and the contempt charges would be dismissed. But that, that, was, uh, that was our year 1969. Okay. Now we get up to December of 1969. 21-year-old um, Black Panther Party activist named Fred Hampton is murdered mm. in a Chicago apartment. Yeah. Um, Hampton was trying to get the gangs of Chicago, particularly, uh, as I recall, it, the Blackstone Rangers, um, to, to exist peacefully. Um, and he was super well-spoken and good at doing it, actually. And, and was, was a young man and everyone related to him. Um, he was sleeping next to his nine-month pregnant girlfriend when the police entered the apartment. Um, in an autopsy, Hampton was found to have barbiturates, you know, sleeping pills, in his bloodstream. Um, everyone that knew him said that, that he didn't do drugs. So they raised the possibility that um, someone had slipped him sleeping pills so that he would be unable to escape. Um, the police enter the apartment and they open fire. Um, Hampton is still alive um, when his girlfriend is taken out of the room. After additional shots are fired, a Chicago police officer is heard to say, well, he's good and dead now. Jeez. That was the uh, the murder of Fred Hampton. Um, just goes to show that uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. Um, state, 19, and this is state state sanctioned violence at that point. In in 1970, on May 4th of 1970, um, protests are ongoing at Kent State University in Ohio. Um, the Ohio National Guard is called in, and they open fire with live ammo on the crowd. Um, 13 students are wounded, four of them are killed. Wow. Um, let me back up a second. Um, four white students are killed at Kent State. Um, a week after Kent State, literally one week after Kent State, the Kent State shooting is May 4th, this is May 11th. The largest urban riot to impact the South takes place in Augusta, Georgia. 16-year-old mm. Charles Oatman is beaten to death while in police custody. Mentally challenged, um, he was accused of murdering his young niece. 
when his body is released to the mortuary, mm -hmm. it shows cigarette burns and marks from being stabbed with a fork. When word of this gets out, riots begin with stores being looted and burned. The police are given shoot to kill orders and more than 60 people are injured by shotgun blasts um, with six being killed. Um, reason I kind of bring this up is even for people like me that lived through the times, we know about the Kent State killings because there were four white students and we've all seen the pictures. Um, we just passed on the fact that six black people are killed in Augusta, Georgia, because that's what happens. Mm. Um, June 22nd, 1970, one month after the, uh, after the riots in Augusta, President Nixon, um, not a, a, a friend to uh, the African-American community. In any capacity. Uh, in any capacity, he signs into law several amendments that extend the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Mm. Um, from 1972 through 1974, um, America is treated to the Watergate hearings. Um, one thing I got to say about my generation over your generation, I'm not saying that we're necessarily better, but man, we knew how we knew how to hold impeachment hearings back in my day. Okay. <laughs> so um, the Watergate hearings convene. Um, 69 people will be indicted. 48 of them are convicted. Nixon is forced to resign. The one that I, I want to call out, the incident that I want to call out, is a clash between Fred Thompson. Um, you need to Google him, but you know him from uh, playing the judge on Law and Order. Um, but he was in real life a lawyer representing the president and Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina. Um, Senator Sam was a legend in North Carolina. Um, he was a, uh, a tough, old, gruff white man. Um, but he was absolutely serious about what he believed. Hmm. So um, this is at the Watergate hearings, and, uh, and, and uh, Sam says that an action by the president had contradicted the Constitution. And Fred Thompson, being a little bit of a wise ass, um, questioned whether that had actually happened, said, I don't remember that being in the Constitution. And Senator Sam, again, this, this gruff old white man, reaches into the pocket of his suit and pulls out this piece of paper with tiny little writing on it and says, you can check it if you want. I always carry a copy of the Constitution with me so that I remember who I work for. Wow. It's one of the uh, coolest moments that I remember. And uh, it was one of those, uh, you just got owned, son. Facts. Do they have YouTube videos of that? There have to, that, that has to be up, right? There, there, there is a, a whole Watergate documentary, and, and a, a lot of the, uh, the moments in it um, were just, you just could not believe it. Um, our attorney general back then, John Mitchell, um, referred to Senator, Senator Inouye of Hawaii uh, as that, that little Jap. Mm. Senator Inouye um, had one sleeve tucked up because he had lost his arm in World War II. Mm. I mean, you just could not ask for more ironic moments than that produced. But it also cast aside the, the, any pretensions that we had of, of not being racist. When um, when the Nixon tapes came out, you know Nixon oh had had gosh. all these conversations in his office. He had his office bug mm -hmm. and had all the conversations um, uh, taped and preserved and and transcribed. You know records of those uh, were transcribed. One of the things that came out was that while uh, while Nixon had uh, had appointed Henry Kissinger to a, to a high post, and Henry Kissinger was um, his his most significant advisor. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, the, and the Jewish community was, was very impressed with that, that in private conversations, um, Nixon frequently used the word kike. Yeah, I remember You know, that's, that. that's our, that's our K word. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, uh, that kind of, that kind of pulled the, uh, the covers off of it. So, you know, well, I've really thrown out a lot of one, one thing I wanted to mention, right. though, is the, that the, there's this duality thing that happens. Like, so when you mentioned, I wanted to ask you about this a little bit more. So you said Nixon 
Um, he extended the Voting Rights Act, right? Yeah, 1965. The Voting Rights Act of uh, 65, he extended it in, uh, in 1970. But go ahead, yep. Okay, so what 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 took place? What happened? Like, what, what was the climate that led to him doing that? That was, uh, that was less than, uh, that was uh, uh, one month and two weeks after the Augusta riots took place. Okay, and the Augusta riots were a week after the Kent State riots, and the, the Augusta riots were because of what again? The Augusta riots took place because a young black man was murdered in police custody and was found to have been burnt with a cigarette and stabbed with a fork. Right, right, because they were trying to get a testimony, and then, yeah, so, so, and then that caused those riots. So then those riots weren't necessarily even about voting. No, they, they weren't necessarily... And, and, and can I make that, can I draw an exact line between them? No, I can't. But it does seem obvious for the timing of, oh my God, these people are rioting. What can we give them to shut them up? That's it. I was, that's, so that's the point I was trying to get to is if it feels almost like, so Nixon was doing this thing to placate the people because of the fact, because of where they were. Because like Nixon also is like very much responsible for the war on drugs, which has been one of the most, <laughs> um, well, I'm going to I'm going to lay that one. I, I'm going to lay that one more on the Reagan folks. But yes, mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly certainly had that also because there was a correlation. Um, these hippies are rioting in Chicago. It must be because they're smoking that bad, that bad marijuana stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I, I back to the original point in this. Every time you look at, at, at a social change taking place, a dramatic social change, whether it's the Voting Rights Act, whether it's the Civil Rights Act, whether it's, it's extending um, those benefits, you can almost always find a period of upheaval and unrest that takes place before then. Right. What motivates the people in power to relinquish some of their power? The fear that if they don't give up some of it, they'll lose all of it. Right. I'll, I'll also tell you, um, history teaches us another lesson about about social change, and I'm going to put this under the under the countenance of, of revolution about, about real dramatic change. Mm. Revolutions take place not when things hit bottom. When things hit bottom, when they're that that bad, you're just trying to figure out where your next meal is going to come from, mm -hmm. right? So you know that. That is common human. Uh, that, that's the common human direction. That when when you're 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 at the brink of starvation, all you're worried about is how can you get lunch and then what do you do for dinner. That's all you have time for. When revolutions take place, it's when you have gone through a period of of positive change and then suddenly there's a downturn. Mm. Right. So. Um, one of my social science teachers told me, and, and, and this was an LBJ phrase, but the way he started off his class, he said, when Lyndon Bays Johnson declared war on poverty, by the way, you mentioned the war on drugs, we've been big in America on declaring war on things. Right, terror um, now. But, yeah. but when we, we declared war on poverty, nobody in America ever thought that poverty was going to win. Hmm. You take a look at how much wealth we have in America. Right. And, and you show that to people, you know, if somebody took a, a time machine from 2,000 years ago, they'd go, well, clearly nobody must be hungry in your country. Right. You must have enough for everybody. And, and yet, um, that's, not the way, that's not the way things are. That said, um, I'm, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some... Um, some things to think about. Um, we're we're running near the end of the time, but but I, I'm going to give you a, a thing to think about. Um, so th these are some statistics that, that I think are pretty interesting. Um, the worst year that we've had recently for war was was 2015. Um, the big war, and again, if you're if you're like most Americans, you're going to go what war? Because it wasn't here and it wasn't one we were in. But you had the the, the high point of the conflict in Syria. And you had a number of different wars in uh, in Africa. Mm. Um, I, you know, uh, again, um, we use the term African American. Uh, uh, most of us are disconnected from from what happens in Africa. So sure. if I tell you that uh, the nation of Sudan and uh, and South Sudan, which would split off and become the world's newest nation, 
fought a, a bloody civil war, it's like, well, we didn't know anything about it because it didn't involve Americans. Right. But it did. Um, mm. So that said, 2015 was, was the worst year for, for war, and it was also a pretty bad year for terrorism. Uh, and again, uh, because a lot of those conflicts took place in Africa and in the Middle East, the line between what's war and what's terrorism is kind of blurred. Um, that said, if you add up the number of people that died in that war, in, in, in all the wars and all the terrorist attacks, you get about 200,000. Wow. 300,000 people died that same year in just acts of violent criminality. So you're more likely, you know, statistically speaking, to get murdered on the streets of Chicago or Buenos Aires as you are to be killed in Beirut, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Right? That's that's just what the statistics are. And if you if you add up that number, if you add up that number as violent stuff and add it in with the wars and the terrorists, you get about five hundred thousand people died that year from from active violence. That same year. 1.5 million people died from disease related to diabetes. Hmm. So I got to tell you, man, it's not the gunpowder that kills you, it's the sugar. Right, right. Uh, that said, it is part of our upward progress that at some time during the 20th century, we passed a line where worldwide, and we're all citizens of this big planet, um, worldwide, more people die from obesity than die from starvation. Right. I guess we fixed that uh, not having enough food problem. Right, right. Wow. Um, I do that. have to go. I am truly honored at your taking the time to, to speak with me. Um, please, you know, stay in touch. We will do this again. Man, and I at some point, that. we will uh, we will have to talk gaming. Sure. Um, I, I know your record. Um, I, I always start off by saying, I absolutely suck at uh, playing games, despite the fact that I'm head of business for, for Night Dive Studios. Sure. Um, I am so bad that when we used to play online games, um, this was actually back in, in the days uh, when I worked at Startup, when we used to play online games, I used to have my son come in as a ringer for me. <laughs> as long as you had somebody, the win's a win, right? <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Um, when we were doing multiplayer testing for, for, for uh, Turok and for Forsaken, you know, a couple of our games, I got to tell you, my kill to death ratio was like absolutely embarrassing. But, uh, <laughs> but the other players were always glad to see me arrive. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Larry, honestly, this is like, it means like the freaking world to me because you gave me one a lot to look up a lot of just information and insight all of this stuff is absolutely important and again i see so many parallels in the stories that you're telling and almost every single thing you've mentioned i can see parallels from there till now and i think that's what what's the most important the most important thing for me is to try to be able to analyze and understand what we're living through as we're living it and that without having an insight into the history it's it's really hard to put a, a good logical scope um on on just what what we're living through you know and and i think you being able to provide that is incredibly incredibly important i like appreciate it. i think you're a wealth of knowledge and it it the fact that you're willing to have this conversation is freaking it's just it's just so meaningful i, I can't even express it thank you so much thank you very much um I'm gonna I'm gonna leave on that note, but but again I'm truly honored by this. Thank Cheers, you. you take care. Alrighty, we'll be here for another one. This